Welcome to In Conversation With, presented by the Council of State Archivists and focusing on contemporary issues shaping the work of state archives. My name is Ann Ackerson and I serve as the Communications and Development Coordinator for the Council. This series is made possible by a CARES grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. In recognition of this moment in which humanities institutions and records repositories find themselves, the conversations in this series will span three broad topic areas, diversity and inclusion, the workplace here and now, and the future of work and the workplace. I'm joined today by Kathy Marquis, Wyoming State Archivist, and Tom Ruller, New York State Archivist, and we'll be discussing the challenges of maintaining a productive work environment and service to the public during the pandemic and beyond. Thank you so much for being here, Kathy and Tom. Before we jump into talking about workplace and workforce issues, I'd like to ask each one of you if you'd take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself and your career journey. What brought you to archives work and to eventually heading the state archives? Uh, Kathy, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, I, I have a lot more understandable, I guess, um, story about how I became an archivist than a state archivist. Um, when I was an undergrad, I worked at the Bentley Historical Library back in the mid 70s. Um, and I was Mary Jo Pugh's assistant. And uh, on the, during the lunch hours, I get to sit at the desk and it was all mine. So um, that kind of gave me a, a taste for what happens in archives and how a reference archivist in particular, and she was one of the very first people to call herself that, um, could make a difference in people's research. And it was kind of exciting. Um, and then I had this funny episode where I went to the, um, career planning and placement at my school. And I said, the, she, the person said, what do you want to be? And I was like, I have no <laughs> idea. And so she asked me about what I was doing now. And then she said, could you become an archivist? And I said, ah, maybe I could. <laughs> <laughs> it was like right in front of my nose. So um, I went from there to the Boston area where I went to Simmons College and worked at um, the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe and then MIT. Um, I went from there to the Minnesota Historical Society, which turned out to be a pretty important precursor for my current job because the Minnesota Historical Society also has the state archives. Mm -hmm. I had no experience with government archives before, but it's Minnesota Historical Society has everything, every possible aspect of history work <laughs> that you could imagine, which was a lot of fun too. Um, and then I went back to the Bentley for a couple of years as the reference archivist um and then my husband got a job in wyoming and so i ended up here i worked as a public librarian for 13 years which also turned out to be a really great informer of there are a lot of things that i'm doing in the state archives now that involve working with the state library and kind of knowing the library landscape in wyoming that i would never have known if i hadn't been part, a staff member at the public library mm -hmm. Um, and then I became the deputy state archivist and then the archivist left. So <laughs> that is, <laughs> that is my trajectory. Um, fell, fell right into it. I kind of did. Yeah. And, um, I think because of my work at the Minnesota Historical Society, where again, I was not part of the state archives staff, but we had one United reading room, which I really liked. Mm -hmm. And, um, regardless of what you came to use, we, the reference staff helped you use it. And that helped me get a real sense of the collecting that was happening and um, what kind of collections there were and how they were organized. So I think without that background, I probably wouldn't be able to do it nearly as effective a job as mm -hmm. whatever it is that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm actually enjoying this job tremendously, which I, hey. I would just never have expected to end up as the state archivist, but um, it's a great place to be. That's great. Tom, how about you? Well, I started off uh, this in the 70s. I was a, still a very young person. And during the American Revolution Bicentennial, I live in upstate New York, grew up here, lifelong New Yorker. And so there was a lot of activity around the Bicentennial. And of course, I had an interest as any young person would in history, but it really was developed at that time. I 
was uh, supported by a great guy uh, who was the local government historian and the director of our local Bicentennial Commission. And he turned me on to the importance of doing research and using documents to tell a story. And so I was fortunate enough uh, in 1978 to get a small part-time job as a local, building a small archives in my hometown uh, with a grant from the New York State Archives. And the folks down at the State Archives at the time, again, said, okay, here's somebody who's crazy enough to be interested in our business. Uh, we've got them. Let's teach them what we know. So I learned a little bit, went and then went uh, through college and uh, have a history degree and then had a library degree, uh, all the while really focusing on becoming an archivist because I realized how important the work that archives is and how without archives and the documentation that archives and archivists preserve, the stories of history can't be told and the decisions of today can't be made at least in an effective way. So uh, after graduate school, I got a job at the Alabama State Archives, working, uh, com coming from upstate New York to Montgomery, Alabama, and really had a great opportunity to learn a lot about government records and about how archives, regardless of where they are, are you know, the, the functions transcend place, the functions transcend the, the story, uh, but the, the, the story winds up requiring that those records and that, that, that documentation. Came back to New York after a couple of years working in the state library, we're processing manuscripts, um, and then got a job at the state archives uh, itself. My first job at the New York State Archives where I guess you could say something started. Worked my way up through the, the ranks. Eventually I became what was called, or what is called the director of operations for the umbrella agency that the State Archives is part of, the Office of Cultural Education, which has the State Library, the State Museum, and the State Archives. So I learned you know, the, the administrative end of the business, budgeting, personnel, and all that sort of stuff. Um, as uh, I was director of operations when the State Archivist retired and had the opportunity to move over as the interim State Archivist and then five years ago was appointed the state archivist. And it is a great job and it's almost like coming full circle from where I started uh, back a few years ago, so. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? How these circles kind of happen in, in people's lives and you see yourself either take either from here and taking them, you know, looking backwards and, and, and seeing the patterns that, that uh, your trajectory has taken. It's really pretty cool, I think. Well, thank you for that. And um, I think to set the stage for our conversation today, uh, perhaps it would be um, a, a good thing to start out by asking each of you to, to share a bit about your archives uh, and what it's been going through uh, this year in light of the pandemic and what it has, what this all has meant for staff and how it's impacted your service to the public. So Kathy, I'll throw it back to you to, to tell us a little bit about what's been going on this, this year. Okay. Um, so uh, we were sent home in March, um, and we, but we were only home until mid-June, and we've been back full-time since then. Um, so the way that the pandemic has hit Wyoming, the numbers have been really, really low until now, where I think we're number one in the country or number two. So um, it's kind of a, it's a real mind shift in terms of thinking about um, how we're responding to that. Um, when we first were working from home, we left about five people. We have two different buildings and one of them were on three different floors. So it's possible to social distance pretty well with one person on each floor or in each building. Um, and we were able to basically, I mean, we never fully closed. We were able to answer questions from the public that way, but we were closed to visitors. Then in mid-June, we started accepting visitors back and we've done that ever since. Um, however, I'm hearing rumblings now about possibly going home again. And I think that's because of where our numbers are now. Um, and possibly the fact that people in Wyoming are somewhat loath to actually follow the directions 
So it's pretty dangerous out there. I'm working from home two days a week now and I hadn't been doing that before. So part of what that's meant for us is um, during the time when most of us were working from home, our, the State Archives has, I, we just lost one this fall, um, but I think we have 14 full-time employees um, and all of us are full-time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we're split into three different sections, the archives, which is the traditional State Archives, um, collecting and reference and acquisition. Um, and then we have a records management unit and we also have a scanning unit, the imaging center. So people from each one of those units were at home. And for some people, for a digital archivist, she was doing exactly the same thing at home that she was doing at the office. Um, but for some people we had to, um, I throw the word around agile around a lot <laughs> these days, because yeah. we, we just basically had to move on a dime and, um, we ended up, um, you know, someone who didn't have internet at home is transcribing oral histories. Um, we set the task of um, bringing into EAD our entire set of legacy finding aids to our scanning staff. And some of them stuck with that the whole time and some of them moved on to other uh, scanning related work. But we did get all of our EAD finding aids, um, all of our legacy finding aids into EAD. We're a small archive, so I realize that other archives are not going to be able to do that, but we're pretty proud of that. Um, and then there were other people who were, you know, normally dealing with the public every day, had more time on their hands and were able to do things like database cleanup, the kinds of things that are on your to-do list forever. And then finally, right. you actually get to right. do it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a real, it was a mixed blessing. Nobody wanted to be home for the reasons that we were at home, but we were actually able to um, get going on some projects that we really hadn't been able to before. Um, and we were able to make the VPN networks work and um, basically um, I think that's what we'll be doing again if we get sent home again. We'll just be doing more of the same. How's the morale um, been, Kathy? Shockingly good. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if we're a group of people who just don't scare easily. Um, and part of that might be that, that n almost none of us have severely health compromised people at home, mm -hmm. nor are we. So if we were, that would be a whole different ballgame and mm -hmm. we'd have a lot of different things to worry about. Mm -hmm. But um, my staff, you know, if I tell them we're going home, there's going to be a lot of moaning. They want to be there and they want to be there now. Um, and I appreciate that um, at the same time. I, I know now that I can completely trust them to get good work done at home. And that's a real blessing too. So, um, you know, maybe when, uh, if we get sent home again, maybe we'll be working more on getting some of the many collections that we have digitized actually linked to our website or to oh, other online services. Yeah. So Tom, you're in a, a relatively big uh, state archives and uh, are you seeing some of the same things that Kathy's seeing? Very much so. Uh, I think the comments about the commitment of the staff and their drive and they don't want to leave uh, says a lot about the people that we work with and the people that our profession attracts. Um, it's it's amazing the creativity and the energy that people have put into coming up with doing the work that we do and not wanting to give up on the level of excellence that we, people expect from from us. It, the State Archives in New York has about 75 full-time employees and then we have you know, student assistants and all of that, that that add up to over 80 folks. So when we first went out and we went out in March like everyone else and everyone stayed home through entirely stayed home through June, we pivoted very quickly. How do we provide staff, which is clerical staff as well as professional staff, with meaningful work to do? How do we leverage this time that we're away to change and modify the program that we have and add to the good work that we've already done? We, in New York, we benefit from um, decades-long commitment to automating our online access. So every record series in the State Archives has at least a series level description through our EAD, access, our EAD finding aid system. 
but we have a lot of container lists um, and much more detailed information. So we had lots of great fodder to give people good, meaningful work to do at home that took our finding aids and brought them into the stratosphere in terms of the depth and the amount of information that we had. We never really closed closed either. We were always open virtually. And there, were a, there was a very small core group of people. On a few days, it was a group of one, uh, satisfying researcher requests and, and all of that. Our, we have a pretty robust program to provide services to local governments across the state. So we pivoted very quickly and had town meetings and all of that on Zoom or on Teams or on some other solution to ensure that we were helping to support those local governments and the non-government repositories that we support across the state. So we leveraged that to really sometimes reach more people and more institutions than through in-person interactions because everyone is home. And so what are they gonna do? Uh, it's an opportunity for them to learn from us and also to interact with us and, and benefit from the work and the knowledge that our staff has. And then, of course, we also run a pretty large record center for state New York state government's inactive records, about 300,000 boxes that we store for agencies. Many of those records are needed in, for their day-to-day -day business. We couldn't really close that. So about a week after the, everyone went home, we determined we could safely bring back two of the, the staff members at that record center to satisfy critical agency needs one day a week. Uh, they'd meet and they'd pull records and make those available. And everyone on the, uh, the agency customer side as well as the staff side was very understanding about how all that worked. We realized being so dispersed and having so many things going on and with such a large staff, it would be easy for people to sort of get lost. So we, we went out on Monday, I think March 17th or whatever day that was. Starting that Friday, we had a weekly all staff call, 80 people dialing in and they all dialed in. And it was really, it was a great way for everyone to maintain their connection, to maintain their morale, to come up with creative ideas. Sometimes those calls would last an hour and 20 minutes with people just talking, especially at the very beginning, what are we gonna do now <laughs> kind of a thing. But uh, so overall, I think we, we learned a lot. We pivoted quickly. And, uh, and the staff remain, uh, even now, uh, committed. We have not opened to the public yet. Uh, our record center operation is pretty much in full swing and our local, our services, our field services are still all done remotely, but there's a, a lot happening. Uh, it's just now happening differently. You know, when we were um, chatting earlier in preparation for this uh, conversation, uh, Kathy, I recall that you, you said something about the fact that that you were really all about adding value at this point and I'm wondering if you could maybe expand on that thought for us. Um, sure and I think that that um, it, it goes back to the last thing that I mentioned which is our staff when I this had already happened before I even got there I've only been there for five years they had been digitizing all along Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the digital files were not accessible to the public. And so I feel like this is a time when we can go back and say, no, really, we want you to have this stuff. <laughs> um, and here's how we can provide access. And whether it's making the finding aids more accessible so that you know that we have it, um, we have, cross your fingers, um, possibly the ability now to um, join archive space, which will give us the equivalent of an online catalog that we've never had before. Um, one of my things to do this week is to follow up with our IT department and find out whether they're going to let us do it because now would be the time <laughs> to do all that background work when people are stuck at home. Yeah, right. So, um, so I guess that's, that's kind of what I meant by adding value. And there's a couple of different um, aspects of that. There's linking, making sure that the digitized assets are actually accessible. Um, with our records management program, it seemed like we were constantly just spending our time training people on the database and dealing with the, the records themselves. Um, a lot of those people are not in their offices and they're not necessarily packing up their records and 
getting them ready to move to us. And so one of the things that we need to be doing is more online training, something, Tom, mm -hmm. that I suspect that your staff has been doing all along, but we haven't been doing as much of. Um, so thinking about how we can reach people, um, you know, we're such a small environment that if you want to talk to somebody, you just walk five minutes or get the car and drive five minutes and you're there. So mm -hmm. now that we're all virtual, how do we reach people instead? So adding that kind of training value as well. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, Tom? Oh, yes. And I think the just, and we see the huge shift, the accelerated shift to almost entirely online training and, and outreach as a great way to add value rather than haul people to a meeting room for three hours of conversation and training. We can give them uh, 10 hours in 20 or 30 minute segments of, of online training, which is now, which is also available on our YouTube channel. So there's a, it's a great, great opportunity for us. And we're seeing the results of increased participation in all that training, in more complex wow. questions, more wow. complex sort of, of issues that people are bringing to us because we're covering some of the, the more simple issues for them. So it's a real, but the rest management program, I think, really of all the areas benefits tremendously. The other side on the just the archival administration and making access to records it has also resulted in a huge amount of, I'll say, additional value. We now, because we don't we don't operate a research room because it's closed, we're doing a whole lot of digitization and digitization on demand. We we have 26 mm -hmm. months records in the state archives. We're not ever going to digitize all of it. We've had an, an active digitization program to make high uh, value and high access stuff available. But there's always, you know, most of the stuff that we do is not already available online. So uh, in the month of August, we set a new record in terms of the numbers of pages that we scanned in terms of reference requests, almost 11,000 pages of material in response to reference requests. That's in addition to all the other stuff that people are getting without our interaction, you know, from our ancestry.com resource or from mm -hmm. our collections. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see how we have been able to reach more customers because they don't have to come to us. They can't anyway. And to deploy the resources that we have in ways that meet their needs so that the person in Buffalo you know, a four hour drive from Albany or the person on Long Island, a five hour drive from here has equal access to the collections of the state archives. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that changes us from an Albany based repository of materials to a statewide resource that can meet any New Yorker anywhere. And I'll just add that um, even though I said something about being five minutes away, that's all the people in state government in my town. Wyoming is a huge state and everything that we're doing will have the same effect that Tom was just talking about, about getting the resources out there. Right, exactly. So uh, you've already talked about, uh, quite a bit, I think, about uh, how, how you've pivoted uh, to work in this environment. Uh, what, are, what are a couple of lessons that you're, you're taking away from this time in terms, about, in, in terms of working effectively? And, um, you know, what's changed and what stayed the same, Kathy? Um, well, the, first and foremost, teleworking. Um, the state of Wyoming, and it, this policy is still on the books, has a very strict definition of what qualifies for telework. Um, and, I mean, we have terrible weather out here. If, you're, if you live in a, another town and the roads are closed between Cheyenne and your town, can't telework specifically prohibited um, and the same there was another one about um, if you want to stay home with your child that is not permissible for telework and I just feel like all over the country that is changing what works for telework what doesn't how we're seeing that people can be productive and possibly even more satisfied um, if we allow them to be more flexible in those ways so I'm hoping that that's a permanent shift here Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I know that we could make it work for some of our staff some of the time uh, and, and some of the staff all the time if it's what they wanted. So that's, that's really the number one. Um, and then I was just going to mention, um, 
uh, there was a, a posting on Facebook from an archival educator who was looking for a virtual project for a student who hadn't necessarily been thinking about doing a virtual project. And I talked with one of our staff and we've ended up um, bringing the, the student on to do several virtual exhibits. And because we had all that digitized material, it was possible yeah. to do. We, we've had to digitize very little simply because of these exhibits. It was kind of all there. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, she's, for the two that she's working on for us, she, she work, is working off of two lib guides that we'd already done. But what she's doing will be much more visual mm -hmm. and much more accessible for people who are just kind of curious, not necessarily academic research. Um, so I feel like those are the kinds of things, um, you know, we could do that again with an intern. Um, we could do it, you know, in a number of other circumstances. So I'd say that the number three thing was just plain old flexibility. There are things that we probably thought we couldn't do that we can. And that's yeah. been nice to see. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Tom, what are your I'll, lessons? Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with, there are things that we didn't think we could do that we can. You know, we're, we're an archive. Don't you have to be there to interact with the material in order to do it? Well, not necessarily. Um, but again, similar lessons. The, having the access to the technology so that folks can get the work done was really very important. And we learned some valuable lessons about making sure that staff are properly equipped, uh, not just with the material that we provide, but most people have a home computer. And how can you, how can you do that? By having so many people dispersed, it really was clear that we needed to have much better project planning and controls and guidance when you send to, to staff so they knew what they were doing and how to do it so that it would be as useful as possible. So if you've got uh, a, an archives clerk doing data entry of a finding aid, we need a template that they use so that we can upload it to our, our uh, finding aid system make sure we have that so that there's and teach people how to use it when we are delivering content to external researchers we got to track that there's lots of hands and people aren't in the office consistently so how do you ensure that the information in that transaction is passed from person to person in a very well-developed way so in, in a way that we don't lose track of those transactions we learned that important, important lesson. So planning and organizing work was really, really important. And that's not something that's going to go away post pandemic. That's something that's going to help us be more successful going forward. Uh, the, and then staff development and how to use the technology to deliver good products. I mentioned our webinars. Someone didn't just all of a sudden one day wake up and say, oh, we need to do 20 minute webinars on these particular topics. Folks spent the time developing some skills, templates for how those webinars work, and so they're appropriately branded and people can use them as a standalone thing, um, and then figuring out how does that content become useful to someone who is sitting in their living room in their pajamas at 10 o'clock at night because they're really bored and can't sleep, so they want to learn about good filing plans. Um, so we're, as well as the people who are at work trying to actually solve a real problem. Uh, so how do we how do we structure those and make them useful for people? Um, that so there's I think I would say staff development, technology awareness, and good project planning and management. Has has your um, style of communication changed also? Um, I'm infinitely more dictatorial and <laughs> um, um, and just irascible, just very hard to. Um, you know, communication is, is, I think for us, again, we're a pretty big organization. So keeping everyone connected when they can't see each other every day has been really, uh, it has changed the way we communicate. You know, someone in my job doesn't talk to everybody all the time. Um, but those staff calls that I mentioned, we have not stopped. We're still, we have staff who have come back, but people, people want it. At one point I said, okay, we're doing this every week. Um, do we need to keep doing it? And two person, absolutely, we have to do it. So we used to have uh, our all archives in person staff meeting every two months, and with emails and the other stuff. 
now we have an all archives in-person staff meeting every single week. And, wow. Um, and you can't, I, my thing is, I don't think you can communicate too much. I personally always believe that, but people now, now more than ever, you really have to make sure you communicate as much as you can because people cannot be set adrift. Mm -hmm. They know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Partly for their own morale, partly mm -hmm. for their safety and curiosity, and partly because of their commitment to the institution. What's happening at the place that I work and the place that I care about? Yeah. Would you say that's true for you, Kathy, as well? That Definitely. Um, one of the things that I noticed was we were having um, a weekly meeting of each of our three subunits and then another week weekly meeting of the entire staff. And from the beginning, I told people that the entire staff meeting was optional since they were all meeting with their subgroups already and I didn't want them to get meetinged out. Um, and it's, it's kind of pleased me how many people have still wanted to be part of that all staff meeting. Not every single one, because there's some people who just really hate being on the computer that way. Um, but, uh, but definitely way over a majority. Um, and then I've also noticed that the two subunits that don't meet in person all the, as much have continued to meet, meet weekly, but the archive staff um, who are kind of most of them all in one room all the time, spaced out as much as we can get us to be spaced out in two of mm -hmm. us in offices. Um, they voted to go back to one once a month. Um, but then we're more likely to run into each other and talk about things that have come up. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it was interesting to notice that. Mm -hmm. So let's take a little bit of a pivot and, and look to the future. And Kathy, what are you anticipating your workplace is going to look like post-COVID? Um, I can still see some of doing some of the meetings online, particularly if some of the people continue to telework in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've all gotten way more comfortable and familiar with online meetings, sharing documents. Um, our records management staff did a lot of training in our database um, over the phone for people who weren't in the city. And I think that it's much more it's a much better style of training to use the video chat. And I know that they'll be using that going on in the future. <clears throat> um, we talked about developing some webinars. That's something that I think will change in the future. And I don't see us going back on that. I mean, that's still something, you know, Tom said before, if it's a cross between sitting in a room for three hours and having bite-sized pieces of information that are more likely to be the one piece that you actually need, um, I think that's a big service. One of the reasons that we were doing some of the in-person stuff was to introduce the staff to each other because they don't necessarily know each other. You know, the staff from one agency and the staff from another agency. Um, but, and I think that we'll still try to facilitate some of that, but it won't be the core of what we do. I don't think it'll have a whole different purpose. Um, the other thing that I see is that our in-person stats are go have been going down for quite a while. And obviously they've gone way down now, even though we're open to the public. <clears throat> so that some of these things that we've learned about um, both virtual learning and um, making sure that things are accessible online, I think will be some part of the way that we handle the archives going into the future. Um, and, you know, we'll never stop accepting people into the reading room. We'll always love that. But um, it won't be, I don't know that it'll be how we see the service we, that we provide. It'll just be one facet of it. So I see that changing too. Um, and then one of the things that I've noticed really just in the last week or two, and some of this is from a presentation that just happened, but all of a sudden we're getting local governments who are more interested in joining our digital archives. So that's something that, um, you know, we started out with state agencies, then we moved to county governments. <laughs> And then we had one brave municipal um, officer who decided that she wanted her municipality to join and now we have five. So I think that um, it's been a time when that seemed like a more viable option for people. And also I think that the ones who are in their offices are kind of looking around at their paper and going, hmm, let's do something about this. <laughs> and look, the State Archives has always already provided a mechanism for dealing with it. Mm. So. Um, 
I see that as being a long-term gain and change for the state archives as well. What don't you want to go back to doing? Um, that's a very good question. I guess, you know, in a nutshell, what we've always done. Um, I don't necessarily want to do things the way we've always done it. And I think that this has given us, I, one of the things that I was talking about before was, um, or that I was thinking about, was the amount of um, staff development that we've been able to do through all the webinars that are available. And I've had some staff who've taken like 20 a month. Um, wow. And you know, not every single one is valuable, but right. they bring new ideas in. It just makes them stretch and think. And I have never considered that wasted time. I mean, if I found out that they were taking basket weaving classes <laughs> during work, <laughs> I guess I would have a problem with that. But, um, but I, I would like to keep on encouraging people to take advantage of those opportunities, mm -hmm. not just when they're at home, but when they're in the office too, and to not see that as somehow implying that they're wasting their time. Yeah. How about you, Tom? What does the post-COVID workplace look like in New York? I think the post-COVID workplace looks uh, a lot like what Kathy described. There, are, there will be people who work from home. Uh, oh, there has to be. It's we've, taken, we've got this great opportunity. The, the staff development piece, I think it also, uh, I think it's, I've talked about this and I think we're gonna actually implement it requiring every staff member to do some amount of staff development, regardless of what their job is in the archives. Even if you're learning how to do build pivot tables in Excel, um, mm -hmm. or uh, how to deal with photographic collections, whatever the, the thing is, um, we're really gonna almost require everyone to do it because we've seen the value and benefit of it uh, yeah. coming back. I think the, the, the realization that on site and in person is not shouldn't be the default and the the first answer it, it should be one of the potential answers and having folks think that through and adopt that that's going to be a challenge but it's going to be what the world is going to be going to demand i think mm -hmm. um, we've seen the benefit so I, I don't know that we can go back to that um it's it, I, and I think the last piece is going back to the just and the, the bonding that people have done. The, you know, the, you don't miss the water till the well runs dry. Well, people didn't have a chance to see each other and interact with one another. And, and I think they value each other as colleagues, as professionals, and as humans more now than they might have before. So, you know, the, the annual archives month pizza party will be a bigger party. Uh, uh, the annual uh, New York State birthday celebration in April will be a more robust and exciting time for my colleagues and me to enjoy. How are you, uh, Tom, building greater resiliency among your staff? I think you've touched upon that, uh, but is there anything else that you want to add to that? And share with us? Well, we, we have tried really hard to, it's part of those weekly calls and all the other communications that we give out and do to remind people of how successful their work has been. Because I, it's easy to say, oh yeah, well, we're doing this because we can't do it the way we've always done it. Um, and and we'll, we'll be able to go back to the old ways as soon as this crisis is over and reminding people that what they're doing in this new way has had a super positive impact. And sometimes that positive isn't the same kind of positive as it would have gotten had we done it the old way. And so there's a lot of communication about success and about impact and how people are doing great, great work. And I'm hoping that positive reinforcement of people's ability to pivot and change and do things in a new way resonates with folks and builds the kind of pathways that help them say, you know what, we can look at this in a different way. And what we're doing now may change again. And that's okay. And uh, 
So that's what I'm hoping happens. I'm see, we're seeing it already in many of our colleagues who over the course of the past nine months have come up with new and innovative ideas and embraced new and creative ways of doing things and tweaked the processes that we threw together quickly in April to make them normal routine operations in August. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's all those things together. I'm hoping uh, and I, I think I'm seeing the staff being more resilient and being able to change and grow uh, despite the adversity of the significant change that they're facing. Right. Um, Kathy, you mentioned earlier the word agility. And I see agility as really key to resilience. So how do you feel you're building resiliency among your staff? Um, I guess I was going to sort of turn that on its head a bit because I think that they've already shown their resilience to mm -hmm. me. Um, I feel like, um, you know, all of us work in state governments. State governments are not known for being um, agile <laughs> or, um, or willing to make big changes like we've had to make in the past few months. Um, I guess my hope for the future is that and I sort of alluded to this before, that we can show by what we've done over the past nine months that um, that change that maybe would never have happened mm -hmm. if circumstances hadn't forced us to make the change can actually work and that mm -hmm. we can actually make quick changes and they can be good ones. Um, maybe we have to do some refining in the, you know, in the months to come because we didn't have that chance when we all just got sent home. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to see those of us in administration and the people who I report to respecting the resilience that we've already seen in the frontline staff and saying, okay, we can, we can see that you can be productive in a variety of different ways. Now let's see if we can facilitate that for you so you feel respected and um, you feel that we value you, not just as a cog in the wheel, but for your expertise and for your human, all facets of your life. That's a great segue into my next question about shifting resources. Now, we know that states are really under the gun with their budgets and there's a lot of uh, red ink flowing and will continue to flow, but are, are either one of you or both of you um, able to kind of shift resources to underscore resiliency among, among your staff? Um, how, are you, how are you kind of managing the, the money side of that? Tom, you want to go first? Uh, <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. Uh, government all over. The money, that, that, that's a foreign concept. <laughs> I, and I shouldn't be quite so, so harsh. We've been fortunate to be able to keep our entire staff fully employed at 100%. There, we have not had reductions in force or furloughs or anything, which has been really a, a wonderful benefit to keeping the morale of my colleagues up, but also enabling us to deliver a good quality program for the people. And that's, that's, really important. Um, are there things that we that, that are we need to shift or hard choices that we've had to make? And I would say that we have not been faced with very super difficult choices yet. Uh, we we were uh, we're at the end of a long positive cycle in terms of government funding and economic which has enabled us in the previous 10 years to make really important strategic investments that were that are enabling us to continue to do our work really well now. Mm -hmm. Buying that $50,000 scanner that allows us to do the kind of digitization that we need to do, well, we did that. And so we've got that, that tool. Uh, but I think we need to look at next year and the year after when a lot of the, the challenges are gonna get much worse and much more difficult. And so part of the, the things that we're thinking about are what are our critical services and where do we 
when that day comes, and that day will come, it's come in the past and it will come again in the future, how are we going to maintain the program and the quality program and the services that people expect in the face of a really significant reduction in our capacity where we can't rely on the, the inertia of the previous five years to carry us forward anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a good answer to your question, Anne, we, but we're, we're starting to figure out what, what are the things we need to focus on so that when we do need to make choices, we're ready. And Kathy, I saw you nodding your head from time to time as Tom was talking. And you're, and you're also walking us through your house, which <laughs> is fun too. <laughs> I apologize for that. It's um, okay. I have a restless dog that I'm trying to make happy. Okay. Um, or, or, you know, everybody could listen to my dog. Your choice. <laughs> I thought we were going to see the China room and maybe a uh, Lincoln bedroom later. <laughs> well, it could happen. Um, so I think that... Um, I mean, Wyoming's budget it was not doing well before the pandemic. And so um, we have faced some cuts. Um, so far, it's only 15%, um, but it's probably going to be more. So we are having, and so far that hasn't hit the archives as seriously as I was afraid it was going to. Mm -hmm. um, but we've just kind of had to rethink some people's job assignments and um, do some splitting of tasks. So far, it hasn't resulted in more than that, which we've been very lucky about. Um, and at the same time, ironically, the, the state legislature had voted us some separate money that we get to spend um, on some digital things that we needed. So, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we've got to be ready for the future and to think about um, where, where we want the programs to go. I mean, one of the frustrating things for me was that I was kind of in the middle of realigning some things and then the budget cut put an end to that. So, um, you know, you just have to be flexible. Um, I mean, one of the differences between Tom and me is that this is my first real administrative role. So I haven't had years to think about this. I'm learning the budget at the same time that I'm um, learning how to reapportion or tasks and um, rethink positions. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's been an uphill curve during an interesting time, mm -hmm. but, um, but that's, that's management. So um, I think that a lot of it is just going back to what the core mission is and trying to figure out what do we really absolutely have to be able to do? Mm -hmm. And who do we have on staff that we can make sure can do those things um, and which things are have been part of our mission for a long time, but maybe won't continue to be. It's really hard to say. I'm not intending to cut anything now, but on the other hand, I haven't been asked to make more cuts mm -hmm. yet. Um, so that's kind of, um, I guess that's, that's how I'm thinking about it. And um, a lot of it will depend on what happens as the pandemic starts to ease up and what that what kind of economic situation that leaves our state in right right and i think one of the valuable lessons of all this getting back to resilience and being able to pivot is okay we go through the exercise of identifying these are the things that are core and critical that we need to maintain but what are the best ways of doing them mm -hmm. and now because of our experience there are a lot on the table and sometimes it's those new options and those new approaches provide or are less resource intensive they cost less mm -hmm. and and you can get a lot more bang for the buck and so that you put all that stuff on the table and it on balance you're doing you're doing more with less and with less effort mm -hmm. sometimes not always mm -hmm. yeah I think you just have to balance that with the perception on the part of your staff that you're asking them to do more with less. Yes, yes. Unless you can make more happen with more efficient 
workflows. Mm -hmm. So it's not actually more work for the employee, but it ends up the, the product has so much value added to it that it's yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think we can leave a conversation uh, about pandemic, uh, the pandemic workplace and the post pandemic workplace without really talking about some of the social issues that uh, have uh, been revealed uh, this year. Um, and so my, my question to you is, will issues of sy systemic racism and social injustice modify or change how the state archives approaches its work? Tom, you want to take that? I think the answer, the short answer to your question, Anne, is absolutely, and it already has. Um, the we we early on established uh, an internal team, uh, diversity uh, and inclusion team, to look at our appraisal practices, to look at our descriptive practices, to look at the kinds of materials that we're making available online. Are they reflective of the the broader society in New York? Um, and do they, do they help us understand better systemic racism and systems that are oppressive to different communities? And how can we make sure that we both reflect what New Yorkers look like and New Yorkers act like and New Yorkers think like? How do we do, make sure that we do that? But how do we show that the state archives belongs to all New Yorkers and all New Yorkers are reflected in these collections. And so that means changing some priorities for what we digitize. So that means changing some of the questions and the analysis points in the way we appraise records. That means changing some of our public programs so that we highlight records that may not necessarily have uh, been, that might have, they're great, but they've been overlooked because they don't have the sizzle that maybe some other records do. So I think there's, there's, a, great, there's a great opportunity that this, I'm just gonna say that this time has presented to us. And the opportunity is for us to show that the records of governments and the records that we preserve and collect really can be an agent for greater understanding of how we got to where we are but also showing that there are a lot of people and organizations and institutions in those records that might not necessarily have been brought out and brought to the fore as they should have. Kathy, is the Wyoming State Archives looking at these issues as well? Um, I guess I would say in an overall statement like Tom's, not as much as we should. Um, and I think that's something that we really have to give some thought to um, now and in the future. Um, it's made me think about um, how we can reach out and office, offer our, our resources as a state archives, as a relatively well-funded archival organization. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do in the last couple year or so is use our SHRAB monies um, I, we reached out to one of the local tribal groups and just the kind of outreach that you do for shrab money because people don't know you have it and they don't know they qualify for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they were originally going to bring in a workshop um, for like a photo preservation workshop, but they ended up finding a, a consultant who specializes in tribal archives records management and they brought her in to show them how to manage their own records. And that it was exciting to be able to support that. Um, and I know that she'll go on and do more with um, more traditional archival materials in the future, but that was her need at the time. And it was really good to be able to share that money with her. Um, one thing that, that I feel like we haven't done hardly at all and that we really need to is outreach to the Latinx community, um, which is probably the single biggest um, minority, if you want to use that word, um, community in Wyoming. We have a number of really great contacts in the community and we've been given some really wonderful donations. I haven't heard anything from anyone about their wanting to start a community archives, mm -hmm. but it's something that we might raise with them because it's a place where instead of trying to bring their materials to us, we could be assisting them in preserving their materials however they choose to. 
right? Um, so that's something that I'd like to see the archives do in the future. There are so few archival repositories in our state. Um, there's really, I mean, you could probably name on the fingers of one hand the mm -hmm. repositories that have significant collections and significant budgets. Mm -hmm. So it's incumbent on those of us in those positions mm -hmm. to be sharing our expertise. And actually one of the other things, um, we're, we're not there yet, but we're exploring the idea of a traveling archivist grant through SHRAB. And that would give us the opportunity to, again, mm -hmm. go to communities and help them with expertise while not trying necessarily to take their materials. Right, right. That's a great idea. I hope you, I hope you're able to make that happen. That would I hope be really so too. Wonderful too. Yeah. Um, we've we've come to our uh, the end of our time, but I do want to give each of you an opportunity to just share any parting thoughts you might have before we, we uh, wrap up. Well, I'll start, and I guess parting thoughts. I think the the archival programs are going to be that will be very successful are the ones that are looking at this current time, the, the, the social changes that are happening, the impact of the, the pandemic, and how we've, we've had to change our, our work um, or accelerate the changes that were already in place in, in many cases, um, are the ones that look at this as, uh, as an opportunity, an opportunity to significantly change the way we do our business or accelerate that change. And, and I, it's, these are very difficult times, but and as a state archivist, um, and I think I, most of my colleagues would say the same thing, this is, this is really where you earn your pay. Uh, and providing that, that leadership and helping your repository and the, your allied repositories do this and get the maximum benefit of the adversity that's been put on them. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can add too much to that, except just to say that um, it's been an amazing time to see what people can do and to encourage that kind of um, flexibility in the future um, and kind of see where it goes. And as you said, Anne, not expect that everything will just go back to the way it was because A, it's not going to, and B, we don't want it to. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank both of you, Kathy Marquis and Tom Reller, for, for joining me today to talk about the archives and its workplace now, its workplace in the future. It's been really thought-provoking, thought and I hope that many of your colleagues will tune in to watch this. So thank you once again.